This podcast is brought to you by eRadio. For more podcasts, check out our website on eradiosa.com or download the eRadio SA app from the Google Play Store. Enjoy. It's time for Medical Monday with uh, ophthalmologist uh, Dr. Dylan Joseph. And today we're talking about something really interesting. Uh, something that sounds a bit like a foreign vegetable. It's called keratoconus. <laughs> Dr. Hey. Dylan, how's it? Hey, Jan, you uh, pronounced that perfectly. Well done. I, I don't uh, hear anything vegetable about that uh, <laughs> pronunciation. So it's a good one. Thank you. I was practicing all night. <laughs> you see, well, no, you've got it. You've got it right. You've got it right. Thank you. I'm I'm, I'm pleased to, to hear that. You know, you you mentioned it uh, a few times in our past conversations. What exactly yeah. is it? Yeah, keratoconus is a a genetic entity. So it's a genetic uh, disorder. What is a genetic disorder? It means it's something inherited from mom and dad and passed down in your genes. Um, it's not to say that if your mom and dad have keratoconus that you're going to inherit it, um, but we just need to know that it is a, a genetic disorder. But what keratoconus is, basically a problem with the cornea. Now, we've talked about the cornea, the, the front clear dome of the eye, um, where these bonds in the cornea that are collagen bonds become weaker and weaker and weaker. And eventually, these collagen bonds start shifting apart from each other. And remember, we talked about the, the, the cornea being shaped, for want of a better word, like a soccer ball. In keratoconus, this cornea eventually becomes shaped like a warped rugby ball. So you can imagine Mornay staying against the British and Irish Lions in that last game and giving it a proper wallop 12 years ago and, and recently. And, and disfiguring that rugby ball as it's flying through the rugby posts, the shape that it takes on or warping of the, of the ball, of the rugby ball of the cornea, has a profound impact on your quality of vision. But essentially, it's a progressive disorder. It is usually bilateral, meaning both eyes, and it is genetic. And so that's our gross definition of keratoconus, but it's a disorder of the front of the eye, the cornea, with progressive worsening of vision because the bonds in the cornea start weakening. Wow. So I was going to ask you now the next question, how do I get it? But obviously you said it's genetics, yeah. so it comes from your parents and, yeah. and the, your grandparents. Well, exactly. So it's, it's all, it's, it's, it's in the genes. It's uh, family related, but there are a number of mm. Um, processes that one goes through that basically trigger it. Um, so some people, uh, you know, believe that the keratoconus, um, if you've got the gene, you're going to start expressing it, which is usually in your teenage years or early 20s. Um, but what we see, there's a lot of really good publications out there and a, and a, a professor of ophthalmology um, at uh, the Rothschild University in uh, Paris, and is also a mathematician. His name's Damien Gatineau. So he's done a lot of good research on keratoconus, the origins, what precipitates it. And his phrase, in inverted commas, is no rub, no cone. So basically the cone is that warped shape of the eye, the front of the eye. Um, but his hypothesis, which has now been widely accepted, is that people who rub their eyes in their early years or as teenagers in their early 20s, um, what you're doing is you're slowly breaking down those bonds. So it's scaffolding that's holding the wow. cornea together. And every time you're rubbing, and rubbing is classically with a finger, so it's bone on soft tissue, with the palm of your hand, which is bone on soft tissue, or your knuckle, uh, which is bone on soft tissue. And either of those is causing a breakdown of those bonds. They've actually done dynamic MRI scans. So dynamic meaning live. So magnetic resonance imaging scans of a person rubbing the eye. And you'll be actually quite frightened to see how disfigured or disformed the eye becomes when you apply that sort of pressure to it. Wow. Um, some interesting, uh, interesting literature as well, uh, where, where, where people present with keratoconus changes just in one eye, and they say, no, but they don't rub at all. And um, you ask about their sleeping habits. And people who sleep on their stomachs, and particularly on just the right side or just the left side, 
um, you won't believe it, but data is showing that the compression from the pillow and that rubbing of the pillow against your eye whilst you're asleep can uh, basically manifest uh, these keratoconus changes or the breaking down in the bonds. So all you need then is the gene. And if you're doing something to stimulate the breakdown of those bonds, being rubbing of the eye or um, you're basically sleeping on uh, the one eye, you can actually uh, break down these bonds uh, slowly. So uh, it's something that you're unaware of as a child or as a teenager. But in, in, the, in the history taking as well, it's very important to ask children whether they have a family member with it, a brother, a sister, an aunt, an uncle, a mom or dad. But, um, you know, also to ask about an atopic history. Do you know what at atopy is? No. Um, okay. Atopy is basically uh, allergies. So okay. you're a highly allergic person. So rhinitis inflammation of the nose, inflammation of the sinuses, a history of eczema, rubbing the arms, itchy skin. Uh, kids with eczema typically get patterns in their, uh, in their elbow flexure and behind the knees, um, hay fever, uh, kids that rub their eyes and their nose vigorously as, as children. One, one's got to be very, very careful about that and treat it as soon as you pick it up. That's so interesting. So would you say, uh, Dr. Joseph, that those are the main factors that actually worsen it, the way you sleep and then rubbing your eyes? Absolutely. And I, I've, I've seen it time and time again. Um, you know, and, and, and Damien Gatineau, who I spoke about earlier, has, has written many publications on it. And I tell my patients, no rub, no cone. And of 99 out of 100 patients that I interview who end up having keratoconus, they have either a past or a present history of rubbing the eye. And that's out either um, uh, because the eye is uncomfortable, so there's a stimulus, there's a physical stimulus to rub the eye to try and make it feel better, or because it's become habitual. So they, it's, it's like smoking. You know, people uh, smoke often because it becomes a habit and a formed habit. So, uh, so rubbing the eye um, has a very similar effect. Uh, you rub the eye because it psychologically makes you feel better as well. Uh, so those two um, we need to try and differentiate between and then try and break the habit. Um, and very importantly, if you're diagnosing keratoconus early, and if there is an atopic history or if a child has asthma, dermatitis, eczema, to aggressively treat that along with the eye symptoms and get them to stop rubbing, and often, if you get them to stop rubbing, like Damien Gatineau says, no rub, no cone. You're not going to uh, necessarily worsen the progression of the, this, this disorder unless it's already beyond the point of no return. And then it keeps um, getting worse and worse. So those are your primary um, uh, aspects of a, an important history that you need to take and to uh, treat aggressively if you see that. Must say I'm guilty of uh, rubbing, uh, you know, with, with my allergies. So uh, that's very, very uh, interesting to know. I yeah, think many people, is, allergies, really, absolutely. Yeah, 100%. And, and, and sometimes it's subtle. Uh, um, yeah. yeah and we, we've got a lot of new diagnostic tools that, you know, previously you look at an eye and on our scans it looks okay or there might be some suspicious points on it. But another chap called Dan Reinstein who, 15, 20 years ago, we really started doing publications on the top 50 thousandths of a millimeter of your cornea. Can you believe it? Sure. Called the epithelium. And that's basically the, a skin layer that covers our bodies. And, and we've mm. also got that same little epithelial layer that covers the cornea. And we have diagnostic machines that just look at that. And um, that in combination with some telltale signs on our other scans is a giveaway, a diagnostic giveaway of keratoconus. And we can now pick it up earlier and we can start uh, treating it earlier. So let's say I have keratoconus now, doctor. How does it uh, mm. affect my vision? So early stages of keratoconus may not affect your vision. You may not notice any change. Sometimes the earliest form of change is people start noticing a quite a rapid a deterioration in their vision quality with their spectacles or with their cont contact lenses. So they may find that they become more short-sighted within half a year, one year, quite rapidly. Or they may develop more astigmatism. So you'll remember astigmatism from many weeks ago. We talked about it. It's the shape of the eye like a rugby ball. Mm. So that can become a first telltale sign that, oopsie, hang on, something is changing too quickly in the visual system. What is it? 
So that may be the first signs, but it can still be corrected with a spectacle or a contact lens to the point that a person doesn't know they have keratoconus. But if they're carrying on with their, their habits, their bad habits of rubbing or their sleeping habits, um, which they can do nothing about, they, you, know, they, you can't blame yourself, um, but it's important that it gets picked up um, primarily either with an optometrist or then with an, uh, a very comprehensive ophthalmic examination. So it can either do nothing or it can start warping your cornea. And when it warps your cornea, you start uh, developing symptoms like um, ghosting, glare, halos, double vision. Uh, things just don't seem very clear. And your spectacles and your contact lenses cannot correct your vision then anymore. So you start losing lines of vision. That's when keratoconus is starting to get out of hand. So, Doc, can it be treated with uh, glasses or contact lenses in general? Early stages, yes. Okay. In, as long as we, we can stabilize the disease or we address the, um, the inciting problems like the rubbing and the, the, the eczema, the, the, the contact dermatitis history, change sleeping habits, um, and then we've got to follow those scans up very closely, potentially, if they're young people, uh, two to three months, maybe three to six monthly then. As, and, and then if we're seeing that the, the scans are stable, then we can monitor these patients on an ongoing basis without performing intervention. But if we see any changes or if we are, or already know that there's a loss of vision, um, albeit a line or two lines, we rather then be a little more aggressive and discuss some treatment options as opposed to just uh, keeping you in specs and contacts. That's exactly what we're going to talk about now as well. What are the uh, treatment options for this condition? Your earliest treatment options uh, and very effective is something called cross-linking, um, corneal collagen cross-linking. So there's two ways of doing this, two schools of thoughts by removing that thin layer of cells called the epithelium. Um, and, and, and the second school of thought, which we did a lot of overseas in the Wellington Eye Clinic and uh, is called epithelium on. And this latter procedure tends to be far more uh, comfortable for the patient and minimally invasive uh, and carries overall less potential complications. But in some literature studies shows that it's not necessarily as effective. Either in our studies that we did, our um, cross-linking with epithelium on showed very effective uh, results. Now, what is cross-linking? So remember I told you the cornea is made up of architectural bonds. It's collagen. Mm. So what we do is we soak that cornea in a, a solution called riboflavin, which is essentially um, vitamin B2. And after soaking it in riboflavin, we then expose it to ultraviolet light. So the ultraviolet light stimulates the riboflavin to, and it releases something called free radicals. And those free radicals then um, uh, allow a stiffening of the collagen bonds of the cornea now, interesting studies as well show that uh, this process, this ongoing process, while we are stiffening the bonds, needs oxygen. So um, oxygen has become a very important part of the therapy uh, of corneal cross-linking. So we've got to allow for the reuptake of oxygen with specific techniques while we're cross-linking uh, into the tissue um, so that there's always oxygen available for the, um, for the riboflavin and the ultraviolet to carry out its cross-linking, so to speak. So cross-linking, is essentially exactly that. It's linking the bonds between the collagen fibers so that they become stiff again, so that you cannot, they cannot further break down. Obviously, if someone continues to, to rub their eyes and we can't break the habits, you know, you can um, negate the effects of the cross-linking. But we do cross-linking to stabilize the corneas. And often in cases that are um, very subtle, where we don't want to lose lines of vision, we can consider this. In cases that are advancing, we'll consider uh, cross-linking um, to try and stabilize the cornea. And moreover, we, we can now combine laser vision correction, which was previously thought to be a no-no with keratoconus. We can actually reshape the, la the, the cornea, not to get you out of spectacles or contact lenses, but to reshape it, uh, to take it from a warped rugby ball to more like a, a normal uh, looking rugby ball uh, so, and then cross-link it afterwards uh, so that you can better fit a contact lens or improve your quality of vision with spectacles. So whatever we do with cross with, with keratoconus when it's really bad, we never we can't promise patients spectacle independence or contact lens independence. We, we try and get them to a point where we can stabilize their cornea so that 
and change the shape potentially with laser so that they can get better vision out of contact lenses and out of spectacles. In really severe cases, you can do something called intax. So intax is inserting um, basically a polymethyl methacrylate, PMMA, um, rings into the cornea, and we've got a femtosecond laser that can create an ultra-thin pocket for you to put this ring in, which basically flattens uh, the, this bulge in the cornea. And they can be very, very effective. And you can then, once that's done, you can combine this with laser to try and reshape it or resurface it a little bit and cross-link it later. So there's a number of things that one can do with keratoconus to try and improve the overall functionality of the patient, the quality of life, and uh, sometimes the quality of vision. And then, of course, you know, there are cases of keratoconus where they are beyond um, intact, they are beyond cross-linking, they are beyond uh, the ability to perform laser vision uh, uh, resurfacing. And unfortunately, they end up in either partial thickness corneal transplants, where you can uh, transplant just the front part of the cornea, leaving the ultra-thin 11 microns of the, of the backside of the cornea intact. Um, and and, and uh, you can also do a full thickness corneal transplant. But when we go that route, it's really end case scenario. Um, you know, there's often scarring. The corneas are very thin. The person's quality of vision is at basically hand movements, which means all you can see is a hand in front of your face. Um, uh, and, and, and then we, we know that by doing a corneal transplant, you're in for a long road of recovery, um, often a year to two years before we can start trying to rehabilitate the, uh, the vision. So there's a lot we can do with, with, with keratoconus. Um, it just depends on the staging of the keratoconus, your age as well, um, and, and how aggressive we, we want to be to stabilize it. Wow, uh, Doc, as always, very, very insightful. I uh, now believe you have some exciting news regarding treatment in your practice. Do you care to share? Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, yeah, we, until now, we've, we've uh, practiced laser vision correction and lens surgery, so cataract and refractive surgery. Uh, while I did my fellowship in Ireland, we did a lot of keratoconus as well. But coming back to the garden route, interestingly, with a... Um, you know, the population didn't lend itself towards keratoconus, but we've seen more and more and more people moving down to the garden route. And of course, with more people moving down, it means younger families moving down with teenagers, with young people in their 20s. So we're starting to see more keratoconus um, filter through, so to speak. And uh, so what we're starting to do is introduce um, uh, keratoconus management in our practice, so uh, offering sort of new state-of-the-art uh, uh, cross-linking methods that we can combine with uh, laser vision correction. We already have that facility available, or laser vision correction and cross-linking. Together, we've got a, a, um, a scleral lens expert. This is another management option that I didn't mention earlier, Jan, that uh, comes down from Johannesburg. She's just dedicated to uh, fitting scleral lenses, and scleral wow. lenses are for for patients that have got uh, such warped corneas and disfigured corneas that they basically pre-transplant status. So sure. it's, a, it's, a, it's a last resort before transplant, but uh, miraculously you can get really good quality of vision in a lot of cases with a scleral lens. So we offer that in the clinic now, and we are offering um, the service of uh, uh, cross-linking, uh, possibly combined with laser vision correction uh, to try and improve overall shape of the cornea, quality of vision, um, remembering not to get spectacle independent, but just to try and improve vision to improve quality of life. So very exciting uh, new addition to the, to the clinic. It's amazing to have all this uh, incredible stuff right on our doorstep, eh? You would always think it's yeah. up there in a yeah. city. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. We bring the city here. Yeah, I mean, you have to. Um, <laughs> the city's yeah. coming here anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it is the semigration capital of the of it the is. country at the moment, isn't it? Eh? It is, absolutely. The garden route. Yeah, no, it, it yeah. totally is. Yeah. It totally is. Uh, the estate agents will uh, vouch for that as well. Uh, Dr. Yeah, Joseph, absolutely. thank you so yes. much as always for sharing your knowledge with us. And uh, how do we absolutely. get in touch with you? 
Yeah, and we're uh, in Neisner, locally based here. Our telephone number is 044-150-0085, and uh, Mariska can take your calls. We have a website too. It's www.drdillonjoseph.com um, with our contact details on the website there as well. Uh, we have a number of uh, social media platforms, including uh, Facebook and Instagram. So go and like our Facebook and Instagram page. We we post a lot of uh, great content um, two to three times a day. We've got a, a fully dedicated um, digital media expert now doing that for us and sure. uh, trying to just provide education and good content so, so people can learn from uh, various eye conditions. And, yeah, we've also started a YouTube channel now as well. So a lot of our content, including this, uh, these these uh, live streams get um, put up onto the YouTube channel. We've got educational YouTube videos uh, to help people understand certain concepts. So, um, yeah, there we go. And uh, uh, we look forward to um, uh, helping you out with the vision correction or keratoconus. Excellent, uh, Doc. Thank you so much. By the way, you have uh, a great uh, person in charge there of your uh, social uh, media. Her name is, is it uh -huh, Melanie? Thank you. Yes, it's Melanie. Melanie, that's right. She's um, she's a she's a French girl, um, but she's got uh, the, some serious French flair for um, <laughs> uh, for the camera and for putting um, some amazing uh, media together. Big shout out to Melanie. She's doing a, a mm -hmm. fine job. A fine, fine job. Oh, Doc, thank you, sir. Doc, yeah. Doc, thank you so much. And uh, until next week, uh, Monday for more Medical Monday. Great pleasure. Excellent. Looking forward to it, Ian. Have a good one. This podcast was brought to you by eRadio. For more podcasts, check out our website on eradiosa.com or through the eRadio Essay app from the Google Play Store.